One of the most difficult concepts that my students encounter over the course of the school year is learning what electrons do and that electrons don't only just orbit or they don't even orbit, just occupy space outside of the nucleus, but that that occupation space has certain energy transitions and energy levels associated with it. So when we get to electron configurations, my students are pretty familiar with the first two energy levels and they've already understood the octet rule pretty well, but one of the things they really struggle with is what to do with d orbitals and f orbitals and what order all of these orbitals fill in. So one of the useful analogies and visual aids that I've found is to use an Aufbau diagram and allow students to fill in things at their desk while I'm filling a large one on the board. It's a really good visualization tool that helps them see the pattern in which these electrons start filling. So I have an Aufbau diagram over here. This is just a regular piece of foam board. Uh, these small transparent cups are called portion cups. Sometimes they're called condiment cups. If you go to a food service supply store uh, or any large place that has a good kitchen supply or anything like that, you'll find these small portion cups there. And I just glued them down onto here with a hot glue polymer gun and they line up fairly nicely if you get one of the gridded boards. Uh, you'll have to play with this a little bit and lay the cups out on your, on your board before you begin to make sure it's all going to fit. Uh, that's the biggest error with this is that you start running off the edge of the board and realize you needed a more board than you planned to have. If you look at my board, you'll notice that the f orbitals are missing. I tend, especially in interchemistry, I completely ignore the f orbitals other than a a casual reference to the transuranium elements and the lanthanide and the actinide series so they know where they are but I pretty much for electron configurations will ignore this in my interchemistry class and by the time I cover it in my advanced chemistry class I don't need a visual aid by this because they've already seen it so I just go without the f orbitals and it makes it a lot easier so I cut things off at the 6s orbital it makes my job of, of working through this example a lot easier I also give my students a worksheet that looks almost exactly like this that they complete back at their desks while I fill this. And any large round object works. I've used dried beans before to represent electrons. You can use marbles, you can use ping pong balls, although watch the size of your container. Ping pong balls are actually just a shade too large for this. Uh, it was very lucky that my dad gave me a giant tube of gumballs for Christmas and I don't really chew sugar gum at all. So I had this nice selection of brightly colored round spheres that I can now use for this demonstration. Uh, and so I just hold on to these. So I use two different colors. You can choose to do this or not do this if you just want to do filling diagrams and put two electrons into each one. That's fine. I say one of them is spinning in one direction and the red spins in the other direction. So we'll just say yellow is the up direction and red is the down direction. It's just a handy way to keep the two different. And what I have students do is I'll put in and I'll pick an element or let them pick an element from the first two rows of the periodic table. So for example, only one electron in the 1s orbital is a hydrogen atom. And only one electron fits in there. It's spinning upward. I tell them by default, put, the, put it in the up position to start. It doesn't really matter, but that's just what I do at a convention. Then we can start filling more complicated ones. But the important rule that I always make them remember is that we have to completely fill an orbital before we can jump to the next energy level. We always occupy the lowest energy state possible. That's just one of the fundamental ways that nature operates. Things go to the lowest state of energy if they're allowed to. And I tell them, think about what you do over summer and think about if you go home at the end of the day, your easiest mode is to go sit on the couch and do nothing. You go to your lowest state of energy by default. So our lowest state of energy is at the bottom of our alpha diagram, 1s. And so we can fit up to two electrons there, but if I try to put another electron in, well, it doesn't really fit. I have to go to another energy level. So once I filled the 1s orbital, I have to go up to the 2s orbital. And I have the students fill out, and we have about three or four of these that we go out through the time. I say, okay, well, we've got four here, and let's say we pick, I don't know, atomic number four this would be beryllium. And if we go to the overhead, we can see what the worksheet looks like. And as they're going there, they can see that there are two spheres or two electrons in the 1s and two electrons in the 2s. So they fill in at their station that there's one electron there, two electrons. And I tell them to put the spins in the opposite directions. And then they've got one electron here and two electrons there. And then I give them the way that we do electron configuration notation that if you have in the 1s orbital, two electrons are present. Then you say 1s2. And I say it's really important to know this is 1s2, not 1s squared, because when they read them back to me, they know math. The class says that's an exponent, and they start to take over. Uh, but we've got more than 1s2 because we've got electrons in our 2s orbital as well. So we have 2s2. 
So our electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. Well, the thing that's really handy about this is when you start getting to the degenerate orbitals, you get to the orbitals that have three or five or seven all at the same energy level. Well, what happens there? And I give my students uh, the rule is Hund's rule, which says that two electrons will not occupy the same orbital unless there is no available orbital of the same energy to occupy. I tell them it's like the bus seat rule. If we get onto a bus and there is a completely empty bus and there's one person sitting in a seat, you don't go over and sit down to that one person and sit right next to them. You're going to go into an empty seat. Why would you sit next to somebody when you have a whole empty seat next to you that you can go sit in instead? Now, if you get onto the bus and every single seat already has a person in it, you are forced to sit in a seat with somebody else. So that's what happens when we get to the 2p level. So then I'll pick an, ele an element somewhere in the 2p or the 3p where we get here. And I say, OK, well, let's pair it up. But well, wait a minute. We have this perfectly open, empty orbital here. Why would you force two electrons that are already negatively charged, they're going to repel each other, and they're going to occupy the same space? Why would you do that when you can just go sit in the next orbital where no additional energy is needed to pair yourself against something that you're already repelled by? So we can show that electrons will fill halfway in all the orbitals before they'll start to spin pair with each other. So if we wanted to do something like oxygen or carbon or nitrogen, we can show that for this electron configuration, we have, and if we go to the overhead, we can see we have two electrons in the 1s orbital, two electrons in the 2s orbital, and then we fill these all with the same spin first before we go through and start pairing them up. So if we went to something beyond that and we started to put another electron into the 2p orbital, now we have to force spinning between electrons to be paired. We now have to occupy two electrons in one of the orbitals once you get up to four in the p orbitals. And we go through this for the p's and the d's. I leave the f's off of this just because it's well beyond what I would want to cover in interchemistry class. Once I've, my kids have gotten the pattern here, we also make sure that they see how to write electron configurations. So you have 1s2, 2s2, and 2p4. So they get to the habit of writing and knowing what the pattern is for electron configurations. Now, I'm going to go to the chalkboard, and I'll show you another way that I get my students to understand electron configurations. This is really how I introduce it. This is the first thing that I do when we get to electron configurations, and I let them know about all of these orbitals that are occupied and how we can remember the order in which they happen. But if we go over to the chalkboard, I also show them the way that the periodic table is divided, and that one of the really beautiful things about our periodic table is that there are very clear sections that correspond to some really important chemical properties of the elements. So this first group here, I tell them, is the S block of elements. This group over here to the far right, we call the P block of elements. And the middle block, we call the D block of elements. And then I do draw in the lanthanide and the actinide series at the bottom. And I say that's the f orbitals. We don't worry about them. And that's about the last time that I talk about them in terms of electron configurations. But the neat thing is we have row 1, row 2, row 3, row 4. And in here, it's like a graph or coordinate system. So you have 1s1 because we're in the first column. Now, I do go through hydrogen and helium because they're separated by 17 columns on the periodic table that we actually have to, you know, 1s1 and 1s2 are a little weird because really helium should kind of be over here. But once we get past that, they can sort of see a pattern. Well, we're in the second row, and I'm in the s, so I have 2s1, 2s2 that they can also use. And then they go on to 2p, 2p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and they say, oh, there are six columns in the p block. And they come over here, there's two columns in the S block. And then when we get to the D block, there's 10 columns and there's 10 electrons that fit into the D orbitals. So they get a really powerful understanding that the periodic table is really worked out to reflect the way that electrons are arranged inside of an atom and that the way we arranged our periodic table was by chemical and physical properties. And a lot of those chemical properties are the result of the way that the electrons are arranged in the orbitals. So when we get here, the other really thing that's nice about using the periodic table is that they see 3s2, or sorry, 3s1 and 3s2 
Then when they get down here, they get to 4s1 and 4s2. And then they hit the d's for the first time. And I've called, told them that the d orbitals don't arise until the third energy level. But it is a good reminder for them that the 4s orbitals come before you ever reach a 3d. So it's another visual aid that they use. So I use the alpha diagram as a really great way to represent what's going on to introduce the idea. And then I can transition them once they understand how to write electron configurations. I can transition them into using the periodic table to find that instead. And it gets them fairly proficient at using the electron configurations before the end of the unit without so much stress about this 4S3D thing that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to many students right off of the bat. You can also have your students make one of these diagrams for themselves or make a classroom set and have them set up in the labs and they can put the beans or the marbles or whatever you want to have them put in there. And then they can do that and fill out the worksheet and you can bring them back as a classroom discussion. Um, I just didn't want to glue that many of them down, so I use it as a demonstration primarily and use it as a teaching tool. But you could also use it after you've introduced them to have them play in more of a kinesthetic method and figure out what's happening inside of these electron configurations. It's really helped my students a lot, and I hope that it will help your students understand electron configurations in a little bit different and a better method. Thank you.